Hello, my name is David Broussard and welcome to the Office 365 Bootcamp. This episode is about OneDrive for Business and how to manage that environment. There's three things we really want to consider when we talk about OneDrive for Business. The first thing is, how do we drive adoption? If you think about it, OneDrive for Business is relatively easy to set up, relatively easy to turn on, and because it's at the very bottom of the governance pyramid, we don't spend a lot of time thinking about how individual users will actually use their OneDrive for Business. The problem with that is, we want them to use their OneDrive for Business. Some users will go out and embrace OneDrive for Business, and they will start putting everything out there. But many users, the lagging majority, will, will not do so. They won't do so because they haven't been told that they have to, and they don't see the benefits for themselves. So one of the things we have to focus on when we launch OneDrive for Business is making sure that users understand why it's important for them to use OneDrive. This means that we need to understand the business problems that they face. Many of these are very common, like collaborating with their peers, collaborating with people outside the organization, sharing documents. When we, do, when we allow them to do that, the OneDrive for Business, especially when we lead by example and we train them on how to do so and communicate to them how to make, how to make use of OneDrive for Business, we will find that adoption is greatly increased. One other consideration to make when it comes to adoption of systems like OneDrive for Business. If we continue to allow people to store their documents in their old repositories, such as file shares, there will not be a pressing need for them to move those out to OneDrive. So one recommendation that we've seen success with at many organizations is to take their old locations and to make it to where it's more difficult for them to store documents there. This can be as easy as turning their personal drives into read-only mode and letting them know you can still get to your files from there, but all new files need to be stored out in their OneDrive for Business. Another trick people have done is they have set it up to where the OneDrive for Business is repla replaces the My Documents folder, but in the end, most of this is about organizational change management and focusing on training the end users how to use OneDrive for Business. Now, once we've actually got people using OneDrive for Business, or really beforehand, we also need to understand how do we manage the environment? Why do we want to manage the environment? Well, we want to make sure that people can do what they need to do in OneDrive for Business, but that they can't do things we don't want them to do. Because in the end, this is about protecting our information. Whether that means taking a document that somebody shouldn't be sharing outside the organization, or putting things in OneDrive for Business they're not supposed to put in OneDrive for Business. So let's take a look at the tools that Microsoft gives us for this. Microsoft has recently launched the new OneDrive Administration Center. You can get to this by going to admin.onedrive.com and logging in with your tenant administration account. I've gone ahead and logged in here. Now, it's, it's important to note that this new administration center is actually um, simply a GUI that's laid upon the PowerShell commands you could have always um, gone ahead and run, but now it's given to uh, give us a nice, a uh, clean and easy user interface for us to use. Let's take a look at the things that we can actually manage here. The first one, and perhaps the one that most people care about, is the, the ability to manage sharing. We can control how we allow users to share in their OneDrive for Business. So first off, we can actually just turn it off entirely. We can say that no one can share with their, one, their OneDrive for Business. Uh, and we can also choose who we can let them share with. It can be um, only existing external users, new and existing external users, but in both cases requiring that person to sign in, or we can let them sh share things externally, but and also without requiring them to sign in, thus an anonymous sharing link. There are many individuals who are used to that on other sharing services, and so think hard before you take that away from people. Another option we have is, can we, can let, can we let the, that's our SharePoint users, we do the exact same thing with our OneDrive users. So in this one area, I can control SharePoint content and OneDrive content and allow them to control how we're going to share. Now, if you've played around with, with the Office 365, OneDrive, or SharePoint, you've understood how the sharing links work. We can actually default what sharing links we want created by default. In this case, the default sharing link that's going to be created on any new share is an anonymous access link, meaning that anyone who has the link will be able to view or edit that particular file. If instead we don't want that to happen, we can actually set this differently. For example, I can set it to internal. What that means is that by default, when somebody hits the share button, it's going to default it to internal only. Now, they can still set it to anonymous access if they want to, but we're, going to, we're not going to prompt them that way to start with. 
If they do create an anonymous access link, we can actually set some controls about how long those anonymous access links exist. For example, if I set the expire to zero days, that link will exist forever. But what I can do is go in here and say that I want to set this to, say, 120 days. What that's going to do is any anonymous link that gets created will be automatically expired after 120 days. Now, the user can set that to a shorter time frame, but they can't set it longer than 120 days. And 120 days after that link is created, it will automatically be removed from the system. It's strongly recommended that you decide what you want that duration to be and set it to something that's business appropriate. The reason is users tend to create links and then forget they've done so. If it's internal people who've got that link, that's one thing. But if you're sharing it externally, especially anonymously externally, that can be a big issue. You can also choose for anonymous links whether you're going to let people only view them or whether you can actually let them edit documents. And at a folder level, can they only view the items in the folder or can they view, edit, and upload into that folder? And all of that is around the anonymous link. I can also go out and limit my external sharing only to certain domains. So when I click on this box here, it's going to give me the option to actually go out and add domains. And so if I want to limit my sharing only to certain companies that I trust or certain uh, email domains that I trust, I can go ahead and put those in here and limit that to my users. And then lastly, I can control what can external users do when they have something shared with them. So the first one that's it's also highly recommended is that external users have to accept a sharing invitation using the account that, they, that it was sent to. Now, you're saying to yourself, well, what does that mean? Anybody who comes into Office 365 that you do an external sharing request with, when they log in, they are logging in using a Microsoft Live ID. Uh, when you go and share that document with them, their Microsoft Live ID might be tied to that email address and it might be tied to a totally different email address. For example, my work email address at catapultsystems.com is not the Microsoft Live ID, that's my home address. So whenever I'm logging into Office 365 for an external share, I'm usually using my home email address. That's a little bit confusing. By clicking that box, what we're going to do is we're going to force the person to log in using that work email address and then tie it to their Microsoft Live ID. That way, we're going to know that we're managing them and, and only that person who has that, that work email address can get in. Lastly, do we want to let external users be able to share items that they didn't create? If I'm an external user, if I'm an external user and I upload that document in there, then I can control if I share it. But if one of my coworkers would, if one of my partners would upload it up there and I'm going into their Office 365 environment, should I be able to then share that document with other users? That's what that one does. Okay, that's what we can control around sharing. So there's a lot of options that we can do. One thing to point out, a lot of organizations believe that it's important that certain users can share, for example, using anonymous links. Certain users can share outside the company. Other users cannot. When you set these permission levels here around sharing, they're going to be the maximum permissible level. So if I were to go in down here in OneDrive and turn this to only external users sign in required, only existing external users sign in required, then that means that no one is going to be able to ever be more permissive. We can still use PowerShell if we set it at the most permissive level that we want for our organization. We can still use PowerShell to go to the individual OneDrive accounts and restrict the permissions down to a lower level if that's something that's important to your organization. Okay. The next big thing that OneDrive has is the Sync Client. The Sync Client is actually quite powerful. It's enabling us to actually take documents that are in my OneDrive and sync them down to my, to my laptop. Well, with these sync controls, we can actually uh, put a, a few restrictions on here. The first one is I can actually turn off that sync button. And if I turn that off, it's not going to prevent people from syncing, but it is going to make it more difficult for them to actually go out and sync because they won't, they'll have to have already loaded the OneDrive Sync Client. Um, the next thing I can do is allow syncing only to PCs joined to certain domains. For example, my laptop is joined to the Catapult domain. If I were, we were to go out there and turn that on, if my laptop wasn't joined to the Catapult domain, I would not be able to actually sync my files down to this. This allows us as administrators to control who can, gain, who can actually sync those files down to their machines. Because if it's a corporate device, I can turn things on like BitLocker. I can enforce certain policies on there. 
and I can prevent them from downloading it to a kiosk PC someplace or to grandma's PC or uh, whatever PC they want to use. Lastly, I can block syncing of specific file types. If there are types of files that I do not want people storing in OneDrive, for example, we had a client who said, I don't want people storing their PST files in OneDrive. You can go ahead and, and click on that button and it will let you add in file name extensions and you can put in those file name extensions and it will block them from being put out into OneDrive. Okay? Uh, this is a way of making sure people don't store whatever type of file is you don't want them storing in OneDrive. Once again, the restriction here is universal. These apply to everybody in OneDrive. So use them with a little bit of caution because you may go out there and say, hey, I want to go ahead and block everybody from uh, uploading, say, JPEGs because I don't want them storing vi their, uh, their photos out there in OneDrive. But then you have somebody in the marketing department who actually works in JPEGs and suddenly they can't, they can't put their files out in OneDrive. Now understand, they can still put the files in OneDrive. This does not stop the web interface from working. These are only restrictions to the sync client, nothing else. The next thing we'll take a look at is the storage area in the admin center. The storage area allows us to actually manage how much storage we want new users to have when their OneDrive is created. By default, you're given one terabyte of data, 1,024 gigs. Microsoft is actually increasing the amount of storage that each user can have. It's up to two terabytes now. It's gonna be going to five terabytes pretty soon, and eventually, it's probably going to be unlimited. But in here, you can go out and control how much storage you want to allow your users to actually have inside of their OneDrive. Um, and there's a, a handy link there to find out how much storage you have available inside of your uh, O365 plan. The next thing you can do is when, and, and this happens, what happens when somebody leaves the organization? When somebody leaves the organization and you turn their license off, that OneDrive account is then flagged for deletion. And by default, as you can see here, 30 days after it's flagged for deletion, meaning 30 days after that, that uh, file has been, um, that user's been deleted, the OneDrive will go away. Now what happens is whoever the manager of that person is, is expected to go out to their OneDrive and grab anything that was business critical and move it someplace else, okay? In practice, they don't always do that in 30 days. So you can actually go out here and say, you know, instead of 30 days, I might make that 90 days or I might make it 120 days, okay? Uh, but in the end, you still have to set it at a specific date because you do want to make sure those things go away. All right, let's talk about device access. Device access is actually saying who can get to their OneDrive for business in and, and, and both OneDrive and in SharePoint. So what I can do is I can allow access only from specific IP locations. This is useful if I want to make sure that nobody gets to, to, to OneDrive or SharePoint except for people who are inside of my corporate network. Now, that does kind of defeat the purpose of the anywhere access of, of OneDrive and of SharePoint, but if you have uh, specific regulatory or compliance requirements that prevent people from allowing anybody to have access to their documents and uh, data except from inside of your network, this is one way that you can go put that on there. Um, you can also go out and say, if there are apps out there that don't use modern authentication, somebody's using, for example, basic authentication, or they're not using OAuth or Windows authentication, you can actually click that and make sure that those apps will not get access to um, the, the, um, the data. Um, one thing that you get with Office 365 is Intune. Now, Intune allows you to manage mobile devices and if you are, if this is important to you, I'd strongly recommend that you take a look at the EMS suite that Microsoft provides and even the E5 licensing that Microsoft provides, which has advanced identity protection um, and advanced uh, management of uh, information. All of that is going to enable you to manage your mobile devices, and that's actually managed in the Intune area. Okay? Um, the next thing we can take a look at is compliance. Now, one of the things that's important to understand about compliance is, and this goes back to this protecting our information, everything to date has been, can people share? And a lot of people get very worried about sharing of files, but I often tell people, you know, look, you let people email, don't you? And if, if I can share a file using OneDrive, how is that different than me emailing the file to somebody and attaching it, right? It's not really very different. In fact, OneDrive is better because I can actually have more control over that file from my OneDrive than I can once I email it to somebody. So there's a number of things that I can do here. I can go out and actually view user activities using the audit log and find out who has been accessing and deleting and sharing files. 
Um, I can also create data loss prevention policies, which will enable me to actually go out and look at documents and make sure that certain documents aren't shared outside my organization. For example, a document that has a number of credit card numbers in it or account numbers or social security numbers. Um, I can also go out and create a retention policy, a preservation policy on my OneDrive files to make sure that if I need to keep them for a particular period of time, for example, a compliance requirement that makes me save things for seven years, I can set that up to make sure that documents can't get deleted. And then lastly, I can get to the e-discovery area from here. Now we'll talk about all of that in more detail when we talk about security compliance, but that's a different webcast. Well, I hope you've enjoyed all of this and thank you very much.